I, ha I have to say, I do, I love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. For us cooks, we're not sports fans. It is our Super Bowl. Although you probably have to leave that out because you can't say Super Bowl, right? Big game. Like kind of oh, really? Okay, it's our Super Bowl. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. I am here in the NYT cooking studio. And today, I don't even know what to call today. Today is a marathon. We are running a marathon today and tomorrow because we are making a complete Thanksgiving dinner from start to finish, including pies. Obviously, you would never forget pies. And we are really filming this video as if I were cooking Thanksgiving dinner straight through, starting just the day before. We're gonna get started. Last year, I had been traveling. It was just my parents and my husband and I, and I did no prep. We didn't start cooking until like noon. We cooked the most delicious Thanksgiving dinner, and my mom and I ate in our pajamas. I've never enjoyed a Thanksgiving dinner more. And to me, one thing I've learned in life is that the more effort I put into things beyond a certain point, like the less I enjoy it. I really went with the greatest hits, and I went with the things on the plate that I want to eat together. Obviously turkey, I'm not negotiating on the turkey. You have to have cranberry. To me, you have to have mashed potatoes and I'm not gonna do like another kind of potato because I don't think that's necessary. I have to have gravy. I want a green vegetable, but I want it to be cooked. In my family, we always, always, always make a New York Times recipe from probably 20 years ago that is a glazed shallot. It gets eaten first, it's so delicious. Then for dessert, I am sticking with the classic pie category. So we're gonna have a version of pecan pie, but it's more like a tart, a pretty classic pumpkin pie, but I have one really fun and delicious sort of addition to it, which is a toasted pumpkin seed topping. And then lastly, a caramel apple pie. Let's get the pie dough ingredients out first. I'm gonna put that together. This is something where if you have the time and this mental space, Think about this. You can go ahead and make your pie dough a couple days before, a week, two, three weeks before, and put it in your freezer. So this is a single crust that I'm gonna make for all the three pies. I'm gonna need four of these. So again, I'm gonna make a single recipe and I have three more in the fridge right now. So I have a cup and a half of all-purpose flour. Then I have 10 tablespoons of unsalted butter. This is chilled. This is a tablespoon of granulated sugar. So this is gonna go in some kosher salt. And I always say this about pie dough, the sugar there is not there to make it sweet, but it's there to encourage browning. So you get like a really beautiful golden crust. So I'm just gonna mix all of that together. Helps to have all of your ingredients cold. So I'm gonna add my butter. I also have some prepared ice water right here. And I'm basically going to toss all the butter pieces. You see it's been cubed into like half inch pieces so that each piece is coated in flour. And then working quickly, smash the cubes of butter with my fingers to kind of flatten them and break them up into smaller pieces. And this is not to be precise at all. I'm just trying to break up the butter a little bit. If you feel like the mixture is getting warm, I would stick the entire bowl in the freezer at that point. But if you're starting with chilled butter, you should be fine. Now I'm gonna add my ice water. I have a little extra ice water here, in case I need to add more. Then I'm gonna take my fork and just really quickly stir this around to incorporate that water. I'm using a fork because if you're gonna stick your hands in there, they're gonna first touch the water and then touch the flour and then your hands are covered in this kind of like paste. I'm actually gonna assemble the rest of the dough on my work surface. One of the many advantages of doing it this way is that my hands are no longer really gonna work the mixture. This is a bowl scraper. You could also use a bench scraper. And as I work, I'm gonna kind of continue to push it back into a central pile. And what this step is doing is it is further breaking down the butter. It is breaking the butter into pieces of different sizes. You get a mix of tender and flaky in your pie crust when you have some really, really small bits of butter and some that are left a little bit larger. The third thing that this is doing is it is distributing all of that moisture really evenly. Pie dough that's not evenly hydrated, you get some spots that are kind of wet and sticky and you get some spots that crack because they're too dry. So this is gonna make sure that that moisture is really, really thoroughly distributed. One of the great things about this method is that it really prevents overworking. When you overwork pie dough, it could just get a little bit tough. So it's just a super gentle mixing method, but it's also really, really thorough. So this looks good to me. I have some really, really small pieces of butter that equals tenderness, and I have some larger pieces of butter, which equals flakiness. So now I'm going to bring this together and just kind of pat it into a rough square. And I'm kind of compacting it a little bit. So I want it to hold together. 
By the way, if when you are patting it together or when you're chopping up on the work surface, if you see lots of little flowery bits, you might have to sprinkle in a couple drops of water, which is why I saved my ice water here. So I'm gonna take my rolling pin and I'm gonna flatten this in kind of both directions until it's about a half inch thick. Then I'm using my scraper to help me compact everything into a nice tight package. And I'm also gonna use my scraper now to cut the dough in half in both directions, crosswise and lengthwise. So I'm gonna make four quadrants of equal size. And you can see that the dough, it's not really holding together. It's still a little bit dry and shaggy looking. So now what I'm gonna do is stack the layers. The stacking is gonna take the pieces of butter and quadruple the number of them. And when that gets flattened out and rolled out, that is gonna make this incredibly flaky crust. I'm gonna roll over it with my pin just to flatten it a little bit. And now I'm gonna wrap it in plastic. So this is done, this just needs to chill. So as this sits in the fridge, the whole thing is gonna hydrate. And the final kind of little tip that I'll give for when you're ever making pie dough, again, because this is sort of a, a less hydrated pie dough, I like to take the plastic and then I like to wrap it fairly tightly. And then I use the rolling pin to actually force that dough to fill in any air pockets in the plastic. This is the most effective step at eliminating cracking when you go to roll out the dough. It does not look good. Okay, this is gonna go into the fridge. It needs to chill for at least two hours. And while I'm waiting for that to chill, I am going to start my turkey stock. To me, even in like a streamlined Thanksgiving where I'm cutting some corners or just like cutting dishes all together, I'm still making turkey stock because stock goes in several of the dishes that we're gonna eat on the table, like stuffing, it goes into gravy, obviously. It also goes into one of the other dishes that I'm gonna show you, which is that shallot recipe. I have a couple pounds of chicken wings. You can use chicken or turkey wings, but I also have my whole turkey, which is still thawing out. Almost all turkeys I've ever seen come with this little like thermometer doodad. I've never used it, they don't work. Your turkey will be hideously overcooked. So that goes into the garbage. Don't be alarmed that there's stuff inside your turkey. The first thing that's in there is the turkey neck. This is a really, really fantastic thing to add to stock. So we're gonna keep this. It's gonna go in my Dutch oven. The other thing that comes, and it's usually tucked beneath the neck skin, which is right here, this flap, is your giblets. So that's gonna come out of here. That's what's in this little bag. The liver and sort of other, uh, other edible parts. Sorry, this is out of my face. It's like, <laughs> not the most appetizing, but the reason these things are included in here is because there's like good flavors to be had from these parts. So we're gonna hold on to these. These are gonna go in the stock. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove the wing tips. Now, you know, when you have bones, you have collagen and collagen is like the secret to a really good stock. So anything that we're not gonna wanna eat like on Thanksgiving, we're gonna wanna add to the stock. Some people use the wingtips to tuck the wings like back and underneath the bird. You can do that. I'd rather the wingtips go into the stock. One of, if not the biggest mistake people make on Thanksgiving is they roast a bird that is way too big. Like a 20 pound turkey is way too big if you're roasting it whole. So I'm going with the smaller bird. This is a 12 pound turkey. But if you're having a really big crowd and you're worried about not having enough servings of turkey, roast two. So I have my aromatics, kind of the usual stuff, nothing fancy a couple carrots, so that's gonna go in. I have a head of garlic. I have an onion. I like leaving the skin on because it gives the stock this beautiful golden color. A couple stalks of celery, you know, manageable lengths. Parsley stems, a couple sprigs of fresh thyme, some bay leaf, some whole peppercorns, that's gonna go in. And then I have a couple of tablespoons of neutral oil, like a vegetable oil. I'm just gonna kind of toss this stuff together. I don't really need a lot of the fat in there. I just wanna get the turkey parts and the aromatics lightly coated. And now this is gonna go into that hot oven and I'm gonna roast it, maybe kind of toss things once or twice just to expose you know, new parts to the heat until I see some like nice browning on the bottom. I have pink lady apples here three pounds. Pink ladies are a good baking apple that you can find pretty much anywhere. So I'm gonna start by peeling them. This is my technique. I kind of go around the stem end, then around the base, and then I peel from top to bottom all the way around. So now I'm gonna cut 
my apples into half inch wedges. I like to pre-cook it to kind of reduce the juices and also because apples can be really firm and they don't always cook through. I like a soft, tender apple in my apple pie. This is a caramel apple pie. It is kind of like a pie version of tart tatin, but like a little less technical. So I have a small saucepan here. I have three quarters of a cup of granulated sugar. So I am making a wet caramel, which is where you dissolve the sugar first in water and make a syrup and cook that to a caramel. So I'm gonna add a quarter cup of water. I have a heat proof spatula here. And I'm gonna stir this really gently. I don't wanna stir it vigorously because I basically don't wanna get undissolved sugar crystals like stuck around the sides of the pot. As it comes to a boil, the sugar will dissolve and I'll get this kind of clear syrup. And it's at that point that you wanna stop stirring. But while it's coming up to a boil, you can go ahead and stir. So I have my apples ready to go. I have my butter here, I have my salt here. And that's because when you're cooking caramel, like once your heat is on and you've started, there's really no good pausing point. So you don't wanna like walk away and have to go like chop up some butter. And I'm starting to get a little bit of bubbling around the side. So I'm kind of just at that point where I'm gonna stop stirring. And now I'm gonna kind of switch modes where instead of stirring, I'm just gonna swirl the pot. And swirling is a way of kind of equalizing that temperature all the way around so you don't get any hot spots. And as it's cooking, I'm gonna take my pastry brush and that little bit of water, and I'm just gonna brush down the sides. And that is gonna dissolve any sugar crystals that are stuck on there and have not dissolved yet. What happens is those little undissolved crystals can set off a chain reaction and the whole thing can crystallize. Cooking caramel is kind of like browning butter. It's one of those processes where nothing happens until something happens. And like, so it's gonna kind of boil at this stage, the syrup stage for a while. All that water is evaporating and it's only after the water evaporates that that sugar is gonna begin to cook and reach that caramel stage. So in the beginning, the bubbles look like boiling water bubbles because that's what it is. But as that water kind of disappears, the bubbles will start to get bigger and they'll start to move a little bit slower. And that's how you know you're at that stage where the water's gone and you're just cooking the sugar and you're about to get to that caramel stage. It's actually kind of boring to cook caramel. People think it's like a little scary, but like I think, I think what people respond to is that you're just kind of sitting there for a little while waiting for it to happen. And that can be a little bit anxiety inducing, but it'll, it will caramelize, I promise. So once you're at that nice, deep, dark amber color, I am going to add my butter. And those cold pieces of butter are going to stop the cooking of the caramel. So be a little bit careful here because it's gonna sputter. There's water in that butter that's now evaporating. But this is gonna drop the temperature of the caramel so it's not gonna cook any further and burn, which we don't want. Then I'm gonna add my salt. Not enough to make it salty, but enough to really kind of enhance the flavor of the caramel. Then you wanna stir until that butter is emulsified into the mixture, meaning it has like blended with the caramel. So this is looking really, really good. It's super smooth, the butter has incorporated. And now I'm gonna drizzle this over my apples. The caramel, which in this stage will harden as it roasts, it's gonna mingle with the juices from the apples and dissolve again. You can see why I don't really care too much if the apples turn brown. The whole filling is brown. The timing is working out well because these are ready to go in and I think my aromatics are ready to come out. So I'm totally fine with this oven losing heat when I open it because I want that temperature to drop. This already smells so good. I'm gonna bring this over here. Basically what I want to happen is the apples are going to release their juices, they're gonna soften and they're gonna kind of mingle with that caramel so you have this like liquid caramel sauce around them. Back to the stock, which we're gonna get bubbling away on the stovetop, and at that point, super hands off. It's just gonna go for a couple hours while you do your other prep. So, I have my other stock ingredients here. I'm gonna add my white wine. I don't even have this over the heat because this is really, really hot still from the oven. I like adding wine to stock because it adds a little bit of acidity. Also, some kind of nice complexity in with that. And I'm just gonna kind of stir it around with my tongs because I wanna dissolve anything that's stuck on the bottom of the pot. Then I'm gonna add my chicken wings. Again, you can do this with turkey wings. So I'm gonna add three quarts of water. And this is just one quart, so I'll refill a couple times. And I'm gonna get the heat under it. Now, depending on the size of your Dutch oven, you might not be able to fit all of that third quart, which is fine. Just keep the remainder of it next to the stovetop and you'll top it off. 
Some people don't salt their stock at all. I like to salt it a little bit because when I'm tasting it as it's cooking, if I don't have any salt in there, it's really hard for me to kind of gauge how much flavor is really in this stock that I'm making. One thing I like to have when I'm cooking stock is like a little bowl of water next to me and a ladle. So this is my setup. And this is what I'm gonna use to skim. The more thoroughly you skim any foam and fat that rises to the surface, the clearer your stock is gonna be. And so I'm gonna bring this up to a boil but immediately drop the heat to maintain a really gentle simmer. You can see how there's some foam beginning to collect on the surface. So when you're skimming, you only really wanna take what's on the surface. So you kind of really have to hold your hand steady and you're just kind of dipping the ladle in there at enough of an angle to get just the very top layer off and then rinsing it off in the bowl. So that's all kind of staying there. I promise that after this step, it's pretty hands-off. You can just come back every 15 minutes or so and skim it. I love making stock. I love the smell of it. It's an amazing thing you can make with basically like kitchen scraps. They have released their juices, so you see that that caramel, which solidified as they hit the top of those apples, has now turned into this like beautiful golden sauce mingling with all those apple juices. So when I grab a paring knife, they yield, they're soft. There's like still even just a little bit of resistance. I don't want them to be so soft that they're then gonna basically like break down into applesauce in the pie. So these can just kind of cool off and then I'm actually just gonna stick them in the fridge and they can be uncovered. With my oven now on 350, I'm gonna toast my pecans and I'm gonna toast my pumpkin seeds which go on top of my pumpkin pie. Just gonna throw them in together in a 350 oven. This is definitely something you could do a couple days before if you wanted to. These are gonna toast until they're like golden brown, nutty smelling. These are gonna toast until they're golden brown and have like puffed up. Five to seven minutes, eight to 10 minutes, somewhere around there at 350. While my nuts are toasting, I'm gonna turn to my turkey. So I have my turkey, it's been really thoroughly patted dry. So it's thawed, there's no like ice anywhere in the cavity. I'm just using salt and pepper for seasoning it. This version with just salt and pepper is still the best turkey I've ever made. I'm gonna make two little slits in the skin that's connecting the thigh to the breast. And that's just actually to expose a little bit of the thigh meat on the inside so that the salt can get in there. Basically, I'm going to give a generous coating of salt across every single surface of the turkey. I like to kind of hold my hand a little bit above where I'm seasoning so that the salt crystals spread out. Try not to use table salt because the whole thing will be really, really salty. So where I made that incision, I have some of that thigh meat exposed. I'm gonna try to really concentrate on that area on both sides. I'm seasoning with one hand. Whenever you season, you want that hand to be dry so that the salt isn't sticking to your fingers. So with the other hand, I'm gonna kind of move around the bird. Make sure you get the wings. Now I'm gonna turn it over and do the back. These are where the oysters are in that little area. By the way, your turkey's gonna come with this kind of flap of like neck skin. I leave that on, I don't trim that in any way. There's nothing wrong with a little extra skin right there. Okay, so I'm gonna lift up that flap and get some salt down. Where I'm hitting the bird with the salt is kind of like the top of the breasts. And now I'm gonna go inside the cavity. I just wanna kind of hit every single surface inside and out. And now, same thing, but with pepper. This bird is now seasoned, this is ready to go. If you have any pooling juices, you can go ahead and dry them off. This is gonna sit uncovered in your fridge. The skin is really gonna dry out, which is what you want. That's how you're gonna get like a nice sort of crispy skin. All that salt is gonna kind of penetrate into the meat, season it really, really well. And then what's great about it is tomorrow, you're gonna take this out, let it come to room temperature and just stick the whole thing in the oven. No aromatics, no stock on the bottom. Your turkey prep is done. I'm gonna start with my pumpkin, which in a lot of ways is kind of the most complicated just because I'm gonna par bake the crust. If you think about the logic of like, you're putting a liquidy filling onto an already hydrated pastry, there's no way that's gonna get crisp just by baking it all together. You really have to bake it on its own before the filling goes in if you have any chance of like baked pastry on the bottom. I did increase my oven temp to 425 because that is what this pie is gonna go into initially to start that par baking process. I don't know if you can hear, but the pumpkin seeds are popping a little bit. It's like a little snap, crackle, and pop of the pumpkin seeds. 
So before I even get to my filling, I actually wanna just get my pie into the oven to start par baking. So I'm gonna grab one of my crusts from the fridge, a rolling pin, a little bench flour, and I'm gonna walk you through what I think is the most seamless and effective way to par bake a pie crust for any kind of custard filling. I'm gonna give my bench, bench equals work surface, a little bit of flour, give it a little flour on top. And whenever I'm rolling out almost any kind of pastry, I like to take my rolling pin and beat the dough with a little bit of force, not so much to crack it, but enough to really kind of start to flatten it and, and work it into a larger surface area. I find that this step helps to soften the butter pieces enough that you can roll it out, but it doesn't allow it to warm up. This step also allows you to kind of change the orientation. If it was a square, you're trying to work it into a round, you can start to do that at this stage. So once you work it into, until it's about a half inch thick, that's when you can kind of switch to just rolling it out. If you start to roll it out and it cracks, continue beating it or just maybe let it temper on your work surface for like a minute. So I'm gonna start to roll this out into a round and I wanna get it until it's about an eighth of an inch thick, which will get me to about a 13 inch diameter. You can see that it's not cracking at all. It's rolling out really, really evenly. And as I roll out, you can see that there are these sort of streaks of butter running across the surface. And that's what you wanna see. That's gonna become that really flaky texture. I'm also frequently turning the dough. I think if you roll it only on one side, you kind of don't know what's happening like on, you know, underneath. So it's better to kind of keep it moving. Okay, so this is looking good. When I touch it, it's, the dough still feels cold. That's really important. If it's getting really sticky and it's not feeling cold to the touch, it's too warm. So you wanna put it on a sheet tray and just pop it back in the fridge. I'm gonna transfer it to my pie plate. I'm using a nine inch pie plate. So one thing you can do to transfer it is roll the dough onto your rolling pin, then unroll it onto your pie plate, like so. So whenever you're fitting dough into a pie plate, you wanna let it naturally fall into the plate and kind of pull itself down. You don't wanna like stretch the dough. So I don't wanna like anchor it here and here and stretch the dough into the side. I wanna let it kind of droop down into that space. So once you have it in there, you wanna really, really firmly press it down all around. It's that contact between the dough and the pie plate that is going to encourage it to brown. If you have air in there, air is just not a great conductor of heat. And so it's just not gonna take on as much color. Now I'm gonna trim around the edge. I'm gonna show you how to crimp a crust. So because this has a really wide lip, I don't have a ton of overhang. So I'm just gonna trim around the pie plate, leaving about a half inch overhang. And I wanna make sure it's even. I like to use scissors for this. I think it's definitely the best tool for the job. Now what you're gonna do is you're gonna take that overhang of dough and you are going to flip it underneath itself to make a kind of like little raised edge all the way around. So see that kind of tucking motion I did with that edge here? It's just gonna tuck underneath itself like that, all the way around. Sometimes you'll see bakers flip it the other way. I like it this way because it kind of hides that seam. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and kind of press that lip outward, making sure it's kind of firmly up against the pie plate all the way around. Now I'm gonna show you a crimp. I'm gonna take my thumb on one hand and my thumb and forefinger on the other. And I'm gonna put one thumb in and then push outward with my other two fingers going around. So I push in from the outside with my thumb and then outward with my other two fingers. And it's gonna make this kind of wavy edge. These two fingers, which are pushing outward, these are really important because pressing down a little bit as well as out is gonna help to anchor that crust to the pie plate. And that's really important when you're par baking the crust because it's gonna help to prevent shrinking. So you can see that I'm flouring my hands because sometimes you get a little bit of sticking and rotating the pie plate as you go. What I'm also doing is increasing the surface area of that crust because I have a single thickness everywhere except for the top where it's a double thickness and I wanna create more surface area so that the crust cooks evenly and I don't get any like undercooked pastry along the edge. So now I have my crimp, it looks really pretty. I wanna pop this into the freezer actually. I wanna get this really, really cold so that when it goes into the oven, I'm gonna get nice definition along the crimp and it's just gonna produce a better textured crust. It doesn't need very long, maybe like five, 10 minutes in the freezer until it's really, really solid. So the idea behind 
par baking is that we want to set the crust and have it be most, if not even all the way cooked before the filling goes in. So we need to basically come up with a technique to encourage the crust to hold its shape. Because if I were just to put the crust into the oven without anything in it, the whole thing will kind of slump down. So I have two pieces of foil here. I have pie weights, which are an actual thing, like little weighted ceramic pieces. But here I'm just using dried beans. You can use dried rice. Obviously, this is a more economical route. And I like to use a lot of them to really fill up the whole plate. So here's my crust. It looks so pretty. It's like super firm. So I'm going to take my fork and just prick the bottom in a couple places. This is to help steam escape, because steam that's trapped under the crust it can create this kind of puffing effect. I have two pieces of pretty heavy duty foil. You could just use regular foil. I am going to fit these pieces into the bottom of my pie plate, kind of arranged perpendicularly. Another reason why you want the pie crust to be cold is because when you put this foil in, you don't want to like, the edge is kind of soft. You don't want to disturb your, the crimp on your pie crust. So I filled it all the way. Okay, so the inspiration for this pecan dessert, pecan pie, but just the top, because that's the only part that I like. It just kind of occurred to me one day, well, why not make a pecan version of frangipan, which is a sort of French almond cream. It's ground almonds and eggs and sugar mixed all together, and it's so delicious. So why not do a pecan version? The first thing I'm gonna do is brown my butter. The brown butter adds so much flavor to the filling. So the process of browning butter is not unlike the process of making caramel, which we did earlier. Basically what you're doing is you are cooking butter, which has a certain water content in it. You're bringing it to a boil and you are cooking it until all of that water content boils off. And what happens is past a certain temperature, all of the milk solids in the butter, which are those little white foamy flecks that you see when you melt butter, those start to caramelize and turn golden brown. And it just makes like caramel flavored butter. So you want to constantly stir it, and the stirring also prevents those milk solids from sticking to the pot and then burning. The higher quality butter you use, the better flavor you'll get, and the higher the content of milk solids. So you'll get more of those little caramelly flecks that I'll show you. I want to get this into a bowl because it's really, really hot, and so I don't want to add it to my filling quite so hot. So you can see all those golden brown specks in the bottom of the saucepan. Make sure all of that gets scraped out. So to cool down my brown butter quickly, I'm gonna add an ice cube. And you might think like, aren't you watering it down? But all I'm really doing is adding back the butter, the water that I just cooked out of it. So this is just a good way to cool everything down quickly. And then while that's cooling down, I'm gonna go ahead and start to assemble my filling. So of my one pound of pecans, I'm gonna add one and a half cups or about five ounces to my filling. So just kind of measuring from here. And now to this, I'm gonna add some Demerara sugar I really love baking with demerara sugar because it just has a little bit more character than granulated sugar. Then some salt. So I'm gonna pulse this. This is gonna be loud. There we go, I had to hit power. Okay, so my nuts are finely ground. To this I'm going to add two eggs. Now these eggs are cold, straight from the fridge, and that's because they're gonna help to cool everything down before I add the brown butter, which is warm. So I want this mixture to be on the colder side if I can. God, these are really like membrane-y eggs. Okay. okay, two teaspoons of vanilla. So that's it, my pecan filling is done. I'm gonna just scrape that into the same bowl. We should be just about ready to check on our crust and remove the pie weights. So, recap of where we are, over 50% of the way through day one. Turkey is seasoned, stock is cooking, pie dough is done, I have two of the three pies, actually three, all three pies working. We're gonna move now into the baking phase for each of them. The end of the day will be getting all the pies baked in between waiting on each pie, I'm gonna do cranberry, which is a really fun, like kind of my favorite recipe of the whole batch. Once that's done, I can do a little prep for tomorrow, like prep my Brussels sprouts, maybe do a little stuffing prep, see what we have time for. Okay, 
So after nearly 25 minutes, I peeked under and the edge is starting to get a little golden. See all that steam coming? See how dramatically that edge puffed? So I'm gonna go ahead and gently remove my pie weights. Now you wanna be cautious here because the number one thing you wanna avoid is having that foil break. And then you have, especially if you're using rice, which has happened to me before, then you have to like pick each individual bean or pie weight out of your crust. Look at how nicely set the edge of my crust is. The bottom still looks pretty wet, so we're gonna put this back in. It's gonna go in at a lower temp. At a higher temp, you're gonna get a dramatic and fast kind of evaporation of that moisture, which is going to cause your crust to shrink. Then you get cracks. The filling is gonna kind of seep in. High temp with pie weights, low temp without. And what I wanna see is I wanna see golden brown across the bottom of my pie crust. Importantly, I waited until this stage of par baking to start my filling because it's very important that I think whenever you're making a custard pie that you actually put a warm filling into a hot crust. It's gonna bake a lot faster. Your filling just has like less of a temperature jump that it has to make inside the oven. The hot crust is important too because if your crust is right out of the oven and you pour your filling into it, any filling that comes in contact with the crust is going to set and it like plugs itself of any leaks. I keep referring to this pie as a custard pie. It's pumpkin, but it's also dairy and eggs. I like a pie with a lot of eggs in it because it gives you that more wobbly texture rather than the texture of just like sweetened puree. So I'm gonna combine my butter, some heavy cream again for that custardy texture plus flavor, and a third of a cup of maple syrup. And I'm gonna bring this to a boil. Then in a, my larger bowl, I'm going to start with my eggs. The recipe uses a whole can of pumpkin. It makes a generous amount of filling. How much filling you actually pour into your pie depends almost entirely on your pie plate. I had versions at home where I had a little leftover filling and then I used a different pie plate and I had one where I used all of it and it wasn't even that full. So this is coming up to temperature. You can see that it's steaming. So it's almost at a boil. I am gonna take now my eggs and this is dark brown sugar which gives a really nice molasses flavor to the pie as well. And so this is kind of the beginning of that custard base. I have my eggs and my sugar. I have my dairy, which is warming up. And this is how you make a custard. You stream your kind of warm dairy into your eggs and sugar, and that's called tempering. So I'm whisking this together really, really well. I want a lot of that sugar to dissolve. And I want all the eggs to be really well broken up. And now I'm going to stream this hot mixture into my egg mixture. So you wanna whisk constantly and stream slowly because you don't wanna cook the eggs with the heat from that cream butter and maple syrup. It smells so good, I love the maple. I have my spices here. I love the combination of warm spices that go into pumpkin pie. Here I'm using cinnamon, allspice, and a little bit of clove. Clove is so overpowering. Sometimes I just think that all pumpkin pie tastes like is clove, because there's a lot of it plus salt, so I like this balance. So I'm gonna get those in to help distribute them. I'm gonna add two teaspoons of vanilla extract. Call that two teaspoons. Then I'm gonna add my whole can of pumpkin. So when you're looking for pumpkin, make sure you're buying pumpkin puree, not like pumpkin pie filling. So I'm just gonna whisk all that together until it's super smooth. You can see it makes this really like luxurious mixture. So this is my custard. When I touch the side of the bowl, it's warm. That's what you want. Okay, so now the topping, which is this toasted pumpkin seed mixture. So to the pumpkin seeds in the separate bowl, I'm gonna actually add a tablespoon of my filling. And the inspiration behind this actually was also kind of the top of the pecan pie. I'm see there's like a, there's a theme here. I really like <laughs> the top of the pie. So by adding some of this filling, I'm taking advantage of the eggs that are in the filling and their binding property. Sugar plus eggs plus butter in here is like gonna make everything kind of stick together. So to this, I'm also adding two tablespoons of maple syrup and it's gonna create this sort of candied effect on the top of the pie. Stir all that together really well to blend it, make sure everything's evenly coated. One of the great things about pumpkin seeds is that when they toast, they puff up and that means that they're filled with air and that means they're like little rafts that will sit on top of the filling. Ooh, it's looking good. It did puff a little bit, but that won't go down. There was some shrinking, but it's still nice and like flush with the top of the plate. So what I wanna do while it's still hot is add my filling. All right, so I was able to use all the filling. And now I have 
my pumpkin seed mixture. And I'm gonna actually concentrate it just around the perimeter. So kind of leaving the center open so you see what a rich color the filling is. Okay, so now I have all of those pumpkin seeds on the surface, and then I just take the back of the spoon and like, I'm not really pressing the seeds into the filling, but just kind of smoothing them out so that they are settled onto the surface. So now back into the oven, 325. In my house, meaning like the collective house of my family, it is not Thanksgiving unless we have this cranberry sauce. My mom has been making this cranberry sauce for decades. And it is from a community cookbook, which I love community cookbooks so much. My mom has several good ones. It is called Jambalaya, and it's like the Junior League of New Orleans cookbook. And it has, I have no idea why she decided to try this cranberry recipe, but it's so perfect in every way. I have not changed a thing. So the only real prep I need to do is to chop up a whole orange. So this is gonna go into my large saucepan. I'm gonna add 12 ounces of cranberries. Then I'm adding golden raisins. Maybe a slightly unexpected ingredient, but cider vinegar. It has a lot of sugar. So if you're gonna make this, please, please do not change the amount of sugar. You will just be making something inferior, frankly. Now this recipe has cinnamon and a little bit of clove, a pinch of salt, and then some grated lemon rind. Medium low heat, and you can kind of give it like a little bit of a stir toward the beginning to help to dissolve the sugar. You know, all the juices are gonna kind of come out of the cranberries and the orange until it comes up to a vigorous simmer and all the cranberries are gonna kind of pop and lose some of their shape. These were frozen cranberries. Frozen is fine, but just go ahead and thaw them ahead of time. If they release any juice, which they usually don't, but you can add that juice in, don't discard that. I'm just gonna let this hang out, slowly come up to a simmer. It's pretty hands-off at this point. And I'm gonna do a quick cleanup and then immediately I'm gonna roll into assembling my pecan pie. I basically want that to be ready to go into the oven as soon as my pumpkin comes out. I just wanna have everything ready to go so I can like not have any idle oven time. So we have all the components ready to go to assemble our pecan. I keep calling it a pie, it's really kind of a tart. I'm using to assemble this a 13 by nine pan, preferably metal. This is a really good one because it has these nice sharp corners. You can use glass, that's totally fine but you can also use a quarter sheet tray, which is this size. So these are all options. So the first step is to roll out my crust. Basically, I'm going to roll this out into a big rectangle. So I'm gonna do that same beating motion. from a 90 degree angle. So I wanna roll this out until I have about 14 inches in length and 10 inches in width. So now I'm gonna get it inside my pan. You can kind of tell by how much overhang you have, how high your sides will be. So that looks pretty good. So I'm gonna use that same technique of rolling it onto my rolling pin and then rolling it back into the pan. And you wanna do your best to center it if you can. So the idea is that you're gonna basically make sort of one inch-ish tall sides all the way around. So now that I have it in here, I'm just kind of patting it down to the bottom of the pan and then kind of up the sides. If you have an area where you're not actually like up the sides, what you can do is trim off a little bit of pastry from one of the taller sides and then use that to kind of patch an area. Now I'm gonna scrape my filling into my crust. Then you can use the spatula or the back of a spoon. I like an offset spatula best. You're just gonna spread that into an even layer all the way to the sides and corners. So once you have that worked in there, I'm going to make my pecan topping. I have one large egg white in this bowl that's room temp. Add to that some demerara sugar, so the same sugar that was in the filling. I'm gonna whisk all of this together really, really well. And I'm gonna whisk it until a lot of the sugar has dissolved because the egg white is mostly water. And I have like a super foamy, kind of opaque white mixture with no liquid egg white remaining. So once you get to this kind of foamy stage, I'm gonna add my toasted pecans. So this is very much like the process when you're making like a little candy nut mix with this egg white and sugar. 
And then you want to stir all of that together and kind of fold until the nuts are completely coated. So this gives them that kind of like candied effect on the surface of the tart. So now I have this mixture and you just want to sort of scatter the pecans across the entire surface. If you were like really going for like a Martha Stewart magazine cover look, you could arrange these like in rows, but I'm just gonna kind of scatter them. And then once they're scattered, I am gonna just arrange them just to get them into a single even layer, okay? The last step is just to sprinkle a little extra Demerara sugar across the surface. I just love that it makes it shiny and gives it like a little sparkle. I would say that's maybe about a tablespoon and then a little bit of salt. So this is gonna go in the fridge and just hang out until we're ready to bake it. It's actually good for it to chill a little bit, let that pastry get really cold, and then we'll get that in the oven as soon as the pumpkin comes out. The cranberries, just to point out, have collapsed. So they've all burst, they've kind of lost some of their volume, and now it's more of a homogenous mixture. The whole thing came up to a nice, vigorous simmer. It looks so good, it smells incredible. So this is done, I can kind of set that off to the side. So what I wanna actually do is add a little bit of ice. One thing to be mindful of when you're making stock is that food safety is an issue because stock is a really kind of fertile breeding ground for bacteria. So it just means that you don't want it to sit at room temperature for very long. And then that is gonna help me to be able to strain it pretty quickly and get it into containers and then into the fridge. So I've mostly just tried to strain the liquid through but I'm gonna go ahead and kind of get the solids draining as well. Because it's like we spend a lot of time really extracting all these flavors and all the collagen and everything from the wings and the aromatics and I just don't wanna waste any of it. I am basically going to get everything that I've strained into quart containers. Save your deli quarts is the point of this. And I think it's time to pull the pumpkin pie. So you can see it's puffed very beautifully. There's just the teeny tiniest bit of wobble in the center, but that's gonna set really nicely as it cools. So here's my pecan. This is gonna go straight in. I turned the oven up to 375. One thing you wanna pay attention to is that because I have that sugar coating the pecans, they can start to get a little bit dark. So it's a good idea to check it at around the 30 minute mark. And if it looks like the surface is getting a little bit too dark, we can tend to with foil. And now here's the cranberry sauce, which is still pretty hot, so it's, it's rather liquid but when this cools, all that pectin is gonna really like set everything. Oh God, <laughs> this is, <laughs> should I do this? No pour some out, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Vaughn, make sure you're getting all the spills. Yeah. <laughs> Happy with the stock yield. I'm probably right at seven cups, if not a little bit more. So that all this is gonna go into the fridge. And then the next thing I really wanna turn to is assembling the apple pie. So here are my apples. I just had them in the fridge uncovered while I was doing all my other prep. Now I'm gonna finish off the filling, which really just means that I'm gonna add my thickener. So I have a tablespoon of vinegar and a tablespoon of cornstarch. So I'm just gonna drizzle this over. So I just wanna stir all this together. You can see that there's those juices in the bottom of the pan. Everything that's in here, we're gonna add into the pie. Now that can hang out here while I roll out my first pie crust. So exact same process as before. I'm gonna roll this to about an eighth of an inch thickness, about 13 inch round. Transferring this to the pie plate, same deal. You can use any pie plate for this. There's plenty of dough. I'm not doing a crimp on this, so I don't need like a lot of overhang. So you could use a 10 inch pie plate if that's all you have. You could use a standard nine inch, you could use a deep dish, it's really up to you. And now I'm actually going to add my filling and I'm gonna start by transferring the apples. They are soft, but they are still like remarkably intact. Like they're not falling apart at all, but they're soft enough that I can really kind of compact them and press them into the pie plate. Again, which is gonna really go a long way to minimizing airspace between the top crust and the filling. Then of course you want all of these juices in there. These are gonna concentrate and thicken. Plus it has all of that caramel flavor in there. I'm gonna put this back in the fridge while I roll out the second crust, just because I don't want this to warm up too much while I'm waiting on that second piece of dough. So now I have this rolled out. This is my top crust. So to assemble, the first thing I wanna do is dip my brush in a little bit of beaten egg and brush it just around the perimeter of the pie plate. 
just an even layer. This is like glue. This is going to help the pastry adhere to the bottom layer. And then just drape the top crust over. Again, you don't want to really stretch it. Let it kind of slump gently over the apples. And I want to press really, really firmly all the way around. Actually, actually I have quite a bit of excess. So I'm going to cut around the pie plate. And the knife, my paring knife, is just flush with the lip of the pie plate. And now I'm going to use my fork. And even though I'm not making a crimp, I still want to thin out this layer of dough because it's actually two thicknesses, the top and the bottom, all the way around the edge. So I have a little bit of bench flour to prevent sticking. And I'm just going to press it into the pie dough all the way around. So this is accomplishing the same thing as that crimp that I showed you for the pumpkin pie, which is increasing surface area, making it a little bit thinner so that it bakes at the same rate as everything else. The egg is going to give the surface of the pastry just a beautiful shine. It's gonna also encourage browning, so it's gonna to bake to this like really gorgeous, warm, golden brown. So the last thing before baking is to cut slits, but before I do that, I'm gonna pop the whole thing into the freezer because we've you know, had it out, we've been working with it for a little bit. I want the pastry to get really cold, and I'm gonna wait until it's cold to cut the slits because I'll get nice sharp cuts. Pecan is ready to come out of the oven. I just checked it, it smells so good. Oven temperature goes up to get it ready for apple pie. Now that that pastry is nice and cold, I'm gonna get like beautiful, clean cuts. And how you wanna cut the slits is up to you. I like to cut pretty long marks because I want that opportunity for evaporation. Amazing. I kind of feel like anything else I get done today is gravy. No, no pun intended, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Truly no pun intended. This stuffing that I'm gonna show you is a really kind of no frills Thanksgiving stuffing. It's the perfect example of that thing I was talking about at the beginning, which is like the more you kind of do to it, the more ingredients you add, I don't think it really gets better. I have here one loaf of white Pullman bread. So the first thing I'm gonna do is cut off the crusts. And to do that, I'm just gonna kind of work in like stacks. Crusts off because I, I kind of like making my own crust with the stuffing. Like I want my own browning on the bottom and sides and top. So I just like starting with a kind of uniformly textured bread. So this I would save. You can let it just kind of dry out. You could stick them in the freezer, but this is good like breadcrumb fodder. So I've done stuffing in the past where like I've used the you know fancy loaf of sourdough and I've torn the bread slices and I left them out overnight. Kind of another thing where I'm like, was that worth it? I don't know. Just get your bread, you know, the day before, because you're not getting it on Thanksgiving, and let it sit out and kind of stale on its own. And then you're just gonna toast the bread slices. So I'm doing this the day before because I can, I have the time, but you could just do this day of. This I'm gonna set aside, but basically in a few minutes when I turn down the oven temperature for the apple pie to 350, I'm gonna also put this in the oven. The bread is gonna dry out. It's gonna kind of turn into like light croutons. It's gonna get a little bit of color on it. I'm definitely gonna give it a toss halfway through because the less moisture that's in the bread going into the stuffing, the more I can replace with stock and eggs and aromatics. Another big, I think, time suck when it comes to like prep is chopping all of your veg for stuffing. So I'm gonna prep my veg. I wanna start by rinsing my leeks, which can be really, really dirty. Usually you have dirt trapped in leeks where like the leafy dark green part meets the kind of light green stalk. So I'm gonna trim off the root ends and then split them lengthwise to wash out some of that dirt. So make sure you separate the leaves. Okay, and then an onion, of course, very important in stuffing. Uniformity of the chop is not important. Like it's all gonna get cooked down. It really doesn't matter. Therefore, this is a great job to delegate to anyone who is willing and has the time. Other things to delegate on Thanksgiving. Appetizer. Tell someone to bring some cheese and crackers or the aforementioned crudite, which I think is a great idea. Wine or cocktails. Have someone else do that. If you have a dishwasher, make sure it's empty by, by the time you sit down for dinner. Okay, so I have all of my aromatics chopped. I want to taste my chicken stock. Mmm. Oh, so good. Okay, my bread has been toasting about 25 minutes. I'm gonna let it go another five or so. And now I'm just gonna start cooking and assembling everything. So I have a large skillet. I'm gonna set it over medium high heat. Let me talk to you about the kind of secret ingredient in this stuffing. I'm adding a half a cup of heavy cream. It might seem a little bit unusual, and it is. It just really gives it a kind of richness in the background that you wouldn't get from butter alone. And it's 
just like a little something that I think makes it particularly delicious when everything else is kind of straightforward. So I'm gonna start by melting six tablespoons of butter. And I'm gonna add my sausage. I have sweet Italian sausage. <laughs> I have a pound of sweet Italian sausage, obviously out of the casing. So I wanna cook this and you know get it all nice and broken up. I want it in little bite-sized nuggets. I wanna get a little bit of color on it. Is it, is it me? Every time I'm here, there's some kind of crazy weather event happening. Someone trying to tell us something? I just wanna cook the sausage until it's cooked all the way through. And if you can get color on it while that's happening, then all the better. So I'm gonna pull the bread out, because that's probably done. Which is looking great, by the way. Okay, so this sausage is done. It's cooked through. I'm gonna kill the heat just for a second. I'm going to put my bread into this large bowl. So now I wanna transfer my cooked sausage to my bowl with the bread, but I wanna leave the fat in the skillet. So I'm not just gonna dump the whole thing in. I'm using a slotted spoon. Everything's gonna make its way into the bowl at some point anyway, but I wanna leave the fat in there for cooking my aromatics. The core flavors for me for stuffing are celery and sage. So I'm sticking pretty close to that flavor profile. So we're gonna cook this pretty thoroughly until all the veg is softened and even starting to brown a little bit around the edges, meaning that it has given off a lot of its water. Scrape up some of those brown bits on the bottom of the skillet. So this will take a good 10, 15 minutes for all this to cook down. While I'm waiting on that, I can prep my baking dish. I have a 13 by nine pan. You can use any shallow three quart baking dish. The important thing is just that you have plenty of surface area. So you have something shallow. You want to develop what to me is the most delicious aspect of stuffing, which is the textural contrast. That difference between the crispy bottom and sides and top and that kind of soft custardy center. So that's prepped. I'm gonna season this with a little salt and pepper. Okay, so this is coming along nicely. I can start to mix my eggs and my cream and my stock. So I'm using two large eggs for this quantity of stuffing. And I'm gonna whisk this just to break it up. Then I'm gonna add my heavy cream. What, to me, what it does is it makes the stuffing lean ever so slightly in the direction of like a savory bread pudding. And now to this, I'm gonna add two cups of stock. The recipe calls for three total. The amount of liquid that you're adding to your stuffing really depends on your bread, how dry it was. So I'm gonna hold back that last cup, which I can then add as needed. So the veg is looking done. The onion is translucent, and like a lot of the leek and onion bits are starting to get brown around the edges. So I'm gonna scrape all of this into my bowl with the bread. So I'm gonna to start to sort of toss this through. I'm not adding dried fruit, which I actually like in stuffing, but I just feel like this is the stuffing that's meant to be eaten with everything else on the plate. It's meant to be eaten with a bite of turkey and gravy. It's meant to be eaten with the cranberry. So it's like, it doesn't need that fruit because it's gonna come from elsewhere on the plate. And so now that I've added that mixture, I wanna fold everything gently. I want, to get all that moisture distributed, plus I want to distribute the sausage and all of those cooked aromatics. The key to determining if your stuffing has enough moisture in it is to kind of pick up a piece of bread and it should feel like a wet, but like wrung out sponge, like hydrated all the way through, but not soaked. Another sign is that the bread is gonna feel hydrated, but you shouldn't have a lot of or even a little bit of pooling liquid in the bottom. It just means that if you have a lot of liquid then, and you've added, a, like there's just a little too much stock in there, it's just gonna take a little bit longer for the stuffing to brown. This is looking really good. There's no liquid standing in the bottom of the bowl. Okay, so this is ready now to go into my baking dish. It's a great thing to assemble first thing because I think that if it gets an opportunity to sit a little bit, just at room temp before baking, it can just kind of, everything can hang out, the flavors can kind of meld, the hydration can even itself out. I have that final tablespoon of butter and I'm just gonna pinch it off into little pieces and dot them across the surface. So this is also gonna help with the browning of that very top layer. I'm gonna cover this tightly with foil and the apple pie is done. So I'm gonna pull it out of the oven and oven is off for the day, we're done. Oh, it's looking so golden brown. So something happened to this pie that I've never seen before, which is that it has like almost risen up and out of the pie plate, which is kind of wild. But 
it looks great, so flaky. Having made those nice sharp cuts with the paring knife after the pie chilled, you really see the separation of the layers. We're done for today, this is day one. Okay, I got eight solid hours of sleep last night. I have my coffee. The first thing you wanna do on the morning of Thanksgiving, if you're following this strategy, is you wanna pull your turkey out of the fridge. That's what I'm gonna do. Room temp turkey, I guarantee, is going to be one of the most important steps in getting like a juicy, not dry, overcooked bird. And I'm gonna, I, the oven is preheated, so I'm gonna get started. I think I'm going to do, I don't know, what should I do? I'm prep some shallots, maybe, I don't know. It's like so early in the morning, I have so much time. It's like, I just feel like I should just take a break already. Even though I have to like make the whole meal, I feel like it's kind of low key because I think the desserts are kind of like the really labor intensive part. Those are all done. I have at least half of the menu already prepped. I think the things that you wanna to outsource today is like if you haven't already set the table, have someone do that early in the morning. Have someone be on drink duty, like filling pitchers of water, maybe opening bottles of wine if that's what you're serving. Your focus has to be on the menu. All the other things, try to outsource. To me, Brussels sprouts, they're kind of a favorite vegetable, but they're definitely my preferred green vegetable of choice at Thanksgiving. I think it's, you really wanna have a green vegetable. I really want it to be cooked. But to me, it's kind of one of the only seasonal green vegetables that's like around at Thanksgiving time in late November. And I am making an extremely simple roasted Brussels sprout. Kind of stole this from my husband because this is how he cooks them. And then I was like, yeah, that's definitely a good way to do it. So I start by just trimming off just a little bit of that dried core end. And then I'm gonna work over a bowl. And what you wanna do is basically separate those dark outer leaves from the kind of light green core. And that's because those looser outer leaves cook in a different way than the tighter, more dense leaves in the core. And we're all gonna cook them together, but they're just gonna get cooked for different lengths of time and at different temperatures. Sometimes you get one that's really big, then you wanna cut the core, the little tight core in half. Okay, so Brussels sprouts are prepped. I have this beautiful bowl of like all of these leaves and I'm gonna put the cores back in this other bowl. So I'm gonna set these over here. I guess I can cook the stuffing. Let's get the stuffing in the oven. It's all set up from last night and I'm basically gonna cook it until, I wanna say the internal temperature is at a certain point, but I'm not gonna take the temperature because the second phase of cooking is that the foil gets removed and then it gets baked at a high temp to really brown the top and to encourage browning on the bottom and sides. So the next thing I'm gonna assemble is my make-ahead gravy. Again, if you have your stock done, you could do this the day before or even the day before that. So I have all my components except my stock, which is in the fridge. So I wanna grab that so I can show you what it looks like when it's cold. So you can see it's nice and dark and it has that like gelatin wobble. That's what you want. I'm going to actually skim a little bit of that fat from the surface because when you're making gravy, it starts with a roux. So it starts with a mixture of fat and flour and all that gets cooked together. And the flour kind of binds the fat. And if you add fat on top of that, sometimes what you get are like little fat droplets in your gravy, which you don't really want. So this is not gonna get bound by the flour. So I'm gonna actually just scrape off this little thin surface of fat. It's also much easier to do this when your stock is cold. And then I'm gonna get my pan over medium heat or so. I have six tablespoons of butter. Turkey's a pretty lean meat. I don't, I'm like, I'm, is anyone getting that much drippings from their turkey? I guess you're gonna get a lot of drippings if you're adding fat, like if you're smearing butter all over your bird and everything. But I'm like, well, I'm just gonna start with butter straight away here. So I'm gonna add six tablespoons of butter. So my butter is melted and foaming. I'm gonna add my flour and I'm gonna whisk constantly as I sprinkle the flour into my fat. Just wanna prevent any lumps. So this is a roux. This is a mixture of flour and fat that gets cooked out. I favor a gravy that is on the thinner side. I think a lot of gravy can be really gloopy and that's what you wanna avoid. So here we're kinda of getting to that point where the texture has kinda of thinned out a little bit, which is a sign that you've cooked out your flour. 
And I'm getting a little bit of that honeycomb texture, which is really just kind of refers to the way that it bubbles in the skillet. And it's starting to turn a little bit golden. But keep going, because you want to get some color on it. So some roux you want to be really pale, like for bechamel. It's like you're not really trying to put color on it. But for this instance, because I want the flavor, that kind of toasty flavor, I'm really cooking it out. And in New Orleans cooking, like some roux are really, get really, really dark. All right, I think this color is looking good. So now I'm gonna add my white wine. Make sure you're using a dry white wine. This is going to instantly thicken everything once I add this liquid. So you wanna whisk constantly because you don't wanna form any stubborn lumps. And now I'm gonna add my stock, <laughs> which is not really gonna pour in. You can definitely warm this up beforehand. You can see that that stock is melting. So you wanna whisk this really well to eliminate lumps. <laughs> so once you get this completely smooth with all of your stock added, we're gonna let this just kind of come up to a simmer. We want the full thickening power of the flour to take effect. And I'm also gonna to add to this my fresh herbs. This is gonna give the gravy a lot of flavor. Okay, so I'm gonna add some salt. You don't wanna add too much salt at this phase because it's gonna reduce a little bit. And you can always season it more. So what I wanna do is bring this to a simmer and then I'm gonna turn down the heat quite a bit. And this is gonna cook away until it's slightly reduced. It's nice and thick. I mean, I, I think the consistency that I go for is kind of like heavy cream consistency where it's like super pourable, but it's gonna coat the back of a spoon. I'm making make-ahead gravy, so I'm not using the dripping, so you're not really tying this to your turkey cooking, which I think is really nice. Because I actually think gravy is one of those things that disappears. Because people's turkeys are really dry <laughs> and you need the gravy. So if you're like, want more gravy leftovers, you can just make it. It's not tied to also making a turkey. That being said, when your turkey comes out of the oven, if you have pan juices, which we might have a couple tablespoons of pan juices, those can get added in while you're reheating. That's only gonna help. What I wanna do next, I'm gonna make a little bit of a time schedule. Okay, so it's noon. Let's say I'm gonna put the turkey in at 1.30. I'll do the mashed potatoes. So that turkey will be out by four. I'm gonna do the Brussels then. So that takes care of that. I'll do the shallots and the mashed potatoes next. And then everything else is done or working. And we'll have lunch. Don't forget to schedule time for you to sit down and like have something to eat, at least a snack. Mm. Mm. My, so my dad is the one who makes this. It's like his dish. And I'll have to ask what made him want to try it. This dish I'm about to make is a true Safet's family favorite. So this is a recipe by Molly O'Neill that was in the New York Times print like food section probably 20, 25 years ago. It's such a delicious recipe and it's so simple. It's for glazed shallots. So I have all my peeled shallots. They're whole. If you have really large shallots, you can break them up into like their little lobes or you can cut them in half. You want them just to be about the same size. So I'm gonna get these into a skillet and you want them to fit in a single layer. So it's really the right amount for just about a large skillet. A couple of tablespoons of butter, sugar, a little bit of kosher salt then white wine. Now I have a cup of chicken stock. So I didn't account for this when I was making the stock because the most important places where you want the homemade stock are the gravy and the stuffing. So this is where you could use store-bought. I'm gonna bring it to a boil over high. And you can see that the shallots are probably about 50% submerged. So this is now at a boil. The butter is melted. I'm gonna turn it down to a simmer. And this cooks uncovered. It's just a really easy dish. So let's take a look at the stuffing. Oh my gosh, it looks so good. It's getting really nice and crispy all around the edges. I think it, I think it probably in another minute or so, I'll pull it out. So this is kind of getting to that syrupy stage. So now I'm gonna increase that heat and they're just about glazed, but I'm actually going to get a little bit of color. This is what the recipe tells you to do is you're gonna get a little bit of browning because there's sugar in that glaze mixture, it'll start to caramelize the shallot. So you get such delicious flavor. So now I'm actually gonna turn off the heat and I'm gonna add that final tablespoon of butter. I'm gonna season it with some black pepper. So when that fork went in, it's like super tender, but it's not falling apart. Oh my God. Mm. So now a lid goes on this. 
These will hang out over there. I'm doing great. I'm gonna cross shallots off my list. So we're right on track. Lunchtime, then turkey. Once the turkey goes in, that's kind of when, for me, the clock starts. The train is on the track. So good thing we have a plan. We're right on schedule. We just had lunch. It was a nice little break. Now I'm gonna put the turkey in the oven. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just actually flip it over because I'm gonna roast it breast side down in the beginning. This is gonna go in. I'm gonna roast it for about an hour and then I'm gonna flip it over. Roasting it breast side down, you don't have to do this, but basically I'm making sure that a lot of those juices that are inside the bird don't all collect like along the back of the bird, which is not really a part that you end up carving and serving. So it just kind of helps to keep all the juices distributed and also it helps to cook the breast. I think the conventional wisdom holds that the dark meat cooks longer, but the white meat is so much bigger and thicker than the dark meat that actually that's the part that takes the longest. And again, after an hour, I'm gonna flip it. And now my mashed potatoes. I have two pounds of Yukon gold and two pounds of russet. You get the kind of buttery creaminess of the Yukons and the fluffiness from the russets. So it's actually really satisfying. You can see the color contrast here. I'm gonna get these going. If you wanted to peel your potatoes in advance, you can just hold them in a big bowl or just in the pot you're gonna cook them in just like this in water. And that's gonna prevent browning. So we're gonna salt this water. You wanna salt it really generously okay, and bring this up to a boil. And in the meantime, I'm going to infuse my milk mixture. With mashed potatoes, I'm adding butter and milk. I like the mix of milk and butter. I might actually top it off with a little bit of water. So I developed this recipe not only with a kind of make-ahead schedule in mind, but also keeping in mind the idea that for a lot of people, the only time they're ever gonna make a recipe that calls for a ricer or a food meal is Thanksgiving. And I just don't think it makes sense to have like a piece of specialty equipment in your kitchen for, for one time a year. So this method actually uses a hand mixer. It actually makes like a super delicious, tender, creamy mashed potato. So I'm going to put my milk into this saucepan here. So I have 12 tablespoons of butter here, a stick and a half. So I'm gonna add my one stick of butter. The four tablespoons that I'm reserving are actually, I'm gonna put those on top of the finished mashed potatoes inside the saucepan and they prevent a skin from forming and like keep everything from drying out. So I'm gonna get that and I'm infusing. This part's a little bit hands off. If the milk mixer starts to boil, you wanna turn that down just to low. I'm keeping my potatoes on high because I want them to come up to a boil. Okay, I have some downtime because I'm just waiting on this. So I'm gonna go ahead and select my platters, label them, get them set out, and I get to choose from the prop wall, which is like my, this is my greatest dream. I need a really large platter for turkey. So maybe this is good for turkey. I like to do cranberry in two separate bowls. Both of these are great so that you have one at one end of the table. Brussels sprouts should go in something shallow and wide. Wait, this is kind of like a gravy boat. Look at how cute this is. Let's use that. All right, I'm crossing cranberry off the list of my Thanksgiving checklist because those are now on the table. All right, so I just turned the potatoes off. They're done. When I put a fork into a piece, it totally, oop, there you go. It slides right in with no resistance and the pieces kind of break apart. That's how you know they're done. Go ahead and drain them really, really well. And then I'm gonna come and add them back to this pot. See all that steam coming off the potatoes inside the pot? That pot is still really hot. So you can see that the potatoes are kind of drying out. You just don't want any water in there. Any water that's present, I mean, obviously we're adding milk, but we're also adding fat and richness. Any water on the potato can kind of encourage that gumminess. I kind of pre-mash them before I go in with the mixer because you do need to break up those big pieces. So this is kind of replacing that ricer step and then the mixer will further break everything down. Now I'm going to add my infused milk mixture. I'm just gonna pluck out the thyme sprigs, but leave the garlic in there. So this whole mixture is gonna go in and I'm gonna scrape any little bits from around the sides. In goes the garlic and that also kind of mashes up. I seasoned the water for the potatoes, but I haven't really seasoned anything else in the mixture. So I'm gonna add some salt and some pepper. And now I'm gonna go in with my hand mixer. So I'm gonna start on low speed just to incorporate everything. I want all that liquid and the potato to mix together. Then I can increase the speed more to like a medium. And 
And that's it. That's really all the mixing that this needs. So the key to just not getting a gummy mixture is just not to mix beyond that kind of like everything's incorporated and looking really nice and fluffy. So I'm going to actually just like smooth the surface of the mashed potatoes, work everything into an even layer all the way around the sides. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna add that reserved quarter cup of milk, pour it over the surface, and my four tablespoons of butter. That's going to prevent a skin from forming on the top of the potatoes. It's gonna prevent them from drying out. This can now go to the back burner. <sighs> mashed potatoes are done. Now that I'm feeling really good about like each individual dish and the assembly, I should go into a reheat schedule. So let's say, so we're gonna have a 5 p.m. sit down. So at 4 p.m., that's when things get serious. That's like game face time. What needs reheating? The gravy, the stuffing, the mashed potatoes, and the shallots. Okay, so I'm gonna whip some cream. So I'm using a nice wide bowl. With a hand mixer, just sometimes you like get a lot of splatter when you're whipping cream. So make sure your cream is really cold. If it's hot in your kitchen because the oven's been on all day, you might wanna chill the bowl. To this, I'm gonna add just a couple of tablespoons of powdered sugar because it contains a little cornstarch. And it just very, very subtly sweetens it, but the little bit of cornstarch in there is also gonna help to stabilize it a little bit. So I have a big metal bowl. I'm gonna start on low. Not to be a broken record, we can throw on a pinch of salt. Just the tiniest pinch. So as the cream starts to thicken, it's already splattering, you can increase the speed of your hand mixer. If you have a stand mixer and it's easy just to kind of like throw it in there and turn it on with a whisk. And I'm gonna go for a pretty soft whipped cream here. So this is, this is kind of just under softly whipped. It's still liquid, but it's thickening. I'm gonna add my powdered sugar. So once it starts to kind of hold those marks to the whisk, that's how you know you're pretty close to softly whipped. Okay, so I can always whip it a little bit more before serving, so I'm gonna stick this in the fridge. The turkey has been in for another hour, breast side up. So as everyone who's walked over to this area of the kitchen has remarked, it smells so turkey-y. Like intensely, an intense turkey flavor clear juices, so I'm feeling like it's probably close to done. This area of the breast, this is where it's gonna be the thickest part. So I take, a, I go in at a couple different angles and take the temp. Wow, this cooked a lot faster than I thought it would. We're already at 160 there. We're done. I'm gonna pull it. I'm gonna get this resting over here. So now we're gonna move on to getting our Brussels sprouts into the oven. I'm gonna to toss them with two tablespoons of olive oil and now, I just toss all these until they're coated. So I'm gonna roast these first. And where those leaves are really, really tight on the inside, they just need longer to cook than the outer leaves. Basically, these are gonna go into the oven and roast. And while they're roasting, I'm gonna toss just the outer leaves with a little more oil. And then they get thrown on the baking sheet. Give them a little shake. Okay, and then when these are done, they'll come out and then stuffing will go in to reheat. And at that point, the oven finally is done. These ovens, they got quite a workout during Thanksgiving. So we have that pecan pie. So to turn it out, I can, I can like move it around in the pan because the crust pulled away from the sides as it baked. So I'm gonna turn the entire thing out just onto a rack. It's pretty sturdy, so we can definitely handle it. Look at that beautiful golden pastry all the way around. So now I'm just going to re-invert it onto this cutting board. So here is the pecan tart ready to serve. This can go back over with my other desserts. Now most people don't have a huge cutting board with like a channel for catching all the juices. So what you can do is set a cutting board inside a rim baking sheet because one thing that's really annoying is like when everyone's about to sit down is you have like turkey juices running off your counter down your cabinets. So I'm gonna get this onto my cutting board. One thing I like to do before I actually start separating the parts is to remove the wishbone. You wanna remove the wishbone because it's gonna allow you then to carve the breasts off of the carcass in one big piece. So I'm gonna go up into the next skin and you can feel for it. That's the wishbone. So I'm gonna use, I have a paring knife. I'm just gonna kinda of cut along the sides of the wishbone. <laughs> this part's very intimate. Okay, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna pull out the wishbone. And sometimes it breaks, which is fine. So I just broke one side. There it is. I'm gonna go ahead and pull out the other side. Oh, I got it out whole. 
There's the wishbone. So you can save it and dry it, and then you can break the wishbone with someone. Okay, I'm gonna carve off the legs. So I already made those slits, which helps to kind of see where the legs connect to the body. So I'm just cutting down through that skin. And then the easiest way to separate them is to break that joint. So I'm gonna kind of pull and snap on one side to pop out that bone, and then I can cut down. So there's a leg. And now I'm gonna separate the breasts. But actually, first I might take off my, the flats of the wings, which I definitely serve. The wings are delicious. That's dark meat, plus lots of skin. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and take off the breast. So I'm gonna slice through, but down along either side of the breastbone. And without a wishbone, there's no obstruction, so I can get my knife all the way through. Then kind of using one hand to help pull the meat away from the carcass, I'm just gonna kind of slice down and remove the breast. So this meat looks good, even though it went higher than I wanted it to when I pulled it. It's fully cooked, but it is juicy. So I think I'm gonna separate off the drumette and then slice the breast. Okay, so now I have all the parts separated. One thing I like to do, I like to pick the meat off of the back, especially the oysters. One of like the, a crime of Thanksgiving would be to leave the oysters on the bird. The oysters are these little nuggets that are nestled into the backbone. If you really wanna like congratulate yourself on a successful, see that like cavity right there? You should enjoy the oyster yourself. It is just like a delicious nugget of dark meat. Do people do this table side? Do people literally, or do they, I don't understand how people do this table side. To me, carving is like, you don't want people to see this part. All right, so I'm not done carving. I'm gonna slice up the white meat. So now I'm gonna separate the drumstick from the thigh. This looks so good. If you wanted to, you could chop, like, top this with some chopped chives or something. I don't think you really need to. You could put a little pat of butter on top. That could be nice. I don't have like too many pooling juices. The gravy's looking really good. I'm so excited. It looks so good. When I look at the plate, I don't think that there's anything missing. I really want to eat every single component. I'm gonna have a little bit of this dark meat, which looks so good. Absolutely delicious. Really well seasoned, juicy, tender, and now a piece of white meat. Mmm, delicious. So I'm gonna make my favorite bite of Thanksgiving. A little bit of turkey, a little bit of shallot. I like to scoop my fork through the mashed potatoes and a little cranberry. My number one favorite Thanksgiving bite. That nails it, it's so good. I went first on the stuffing, and so I took the corner piece, one of the corner pieces, which is obviously the prime piece because you get bits of stuffing like this, which is like crispy and caramelized all the way around. Mm. What I said before about how there's not a lot of acid on the plate in Thanksgiving, there's also not a lot of crunch on the plate. So for that textural contrast, it's really important that you have those crispy bits of stuffing. Brussels sprouts, so good. Again, you get a little crispy texture. Little hint of brightness from the lemon. This is not a throwaway side at all. This really brings me back to Thanksgiving last year where we ate in our pajamas. <laughs> it was like so chill, wasn't like freaking out about timing or anything, and it was the best plate of Thanksgiving food I've ever had. And this, I think, is even a little bit better. I'm so excited to cut the pies. You're gonna see when I cut them. There was nothing lost by making the pies the day before and letting them just sit out overnight. The pastry is still super crisp, so I'm starting with apple. You can see that the pie is juicy, but if you can look into the pie plate, there is like really no liquid pooling in there. Mm, that caramel is not so much adding sweetness, it's adding like just all that great kind of toasty caramel flavor. The apples, really maintained their shape. Okay, now I'm gonna try pumpkin. I'm gonna start here, just at that point. Taste it on its own. You get some of that maple flavor, which I think blends really well with the warm spice. And now for pecan, which I kind of saved for last because I kind of think it's my favorite. What I love about this is you could just pick it up and eat it. As we saw before, beautiful caramelized bottom. 
It gets so much flavor from the toasted pecans inside the filling. You have the kind of caramelly depth from the brown butter and the demerara sugar. This makes me not even like remember what pecan pie tastes like. This is the only version of pecan pie that I kind of want to eat going forward. It's delicious. Mm, so good. This is part of our Try This at Home series, a little bit different than our other episodes, which tend to focus on baking projects, but Thanksgiving is a huge project. So I hope you get a chance to enjoy time with family and friends on Thanksgiving, practice whatever traditions are close to you, but hopefully work in some of the wisdom and recipes that we showed you here today. So thank you so much for watching and happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> oh, 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 oh.